Right, let's get started. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is a practice of a talk I'm giving at Scala Exchange in a few weeks. So I've never done this before. It's not very polished. Apologies in advance. Uh, I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning, uh, which is a machine learning technique that's becoming quite popular these days. Uh, mostly thanks to stuff like this. This is uh, the first game that AlphaGo won against me instead of a very famous breakthrough in ComputerGo beating a, a, a human master for almost the first time. Um, so DeepMind is a company that's been doing, uh, they made AlphaGo, and they've been doing a lot of uh, quite popular and successful stuff like this. So reinforcement learning has been proved to be useful in a lot of different scenarios. Um, reinforcement learning basically looks like this. Um, so if you can frame your problem, whatever it might be, into this kind of format, then you can use reinforcement learning and solve it in interesting ways. So it's very versatile. Um, it's used for everything from like stock trading, predicting stock prices, steering helicopters, playing Go and chess and backgammon, all kinds of stuff. And they all, if you squint hard enough and you kind of massage them enough, you can all get them all into this kind of format. So we have an agent, uh, which is the thing that does the learning, the reinforcement learning, and that agent is living inside an environment. So every time step T, the agent uh, is in a certain state, ST, um, it takes an action, it can choose an action to take. There's a, a limited set of actions it can take, it has to choose one. In the environment, based on that action, it will give the agent some kind of reward, uh, which might be zero, or it might be negative, if they did something bad. So it'll give them a numerical reward, and it will also say, now you're in this state, S, P plus one, which might be the same state, it might not. And that's, that's it, it's a very simple framework, but just based on that and the kind of mathematics behind that, uh, there's some very powerful learning that you can do. So the whole point of reinforcement learning is in this kind of situation, how can you make your agent smarter? How does it look at the rewards that it gets over time and use those in order to choose actions more wisely in the future? So the thing that I think is really interesting about Reinforcement learning is the unsupervised learning aspect to it. Usually, if you think of machine learning, then you think about, uh, say, you've got a neural network, you need to train it up so you have a labeled set of training data where you say, like, in, for these inputs, this is the correct answer. You do that over and over again, and it kind of it tunes itself, and then you, you have a trained um, neural network. But this is quite different. Here, you're not giving it the correct answer, you just kind of start off with a really dumb agent and you let it loose on the world and gradually it learns for itself. It tries things, it makes mistakes, it discovers the things that go quite well and it gradually teaches itself how to do the problem. So that's really interesting. Um, this is, uh, there's a famous quote, which may or may not have been said by this guy, Otto von Bismarck, and it goes, fools say they learn from experience. I prefer to learn from the experience of others. So it's obvious from this that Otto, he was a fan of supervised learning. But in this, in the remainder of this talk, I'm gonna to stick two fingers up to Otto and say, no, learning from experience is awesome. And I'm gonna show him how. So the other interesting thing about um, Reinforcement learning, which makes it quite unique in the whole machine learning sphere, I suppose, is this concept of deferred rewards. I was looking for a picture of to signify deferred rewards, so I googled far away gold. It turns out that there's actually a perfume called far away gold. Um, but the point of deferred rewards is you might take some action, and at that point you don't get an immediate reward. But then you take 10 more actions, and then eventually you get to something, some state which will be very beneficial to you. You'll get a reward. So in some way, you need to credit all of those actions that you took, that whole chain of actions. They need to get some kind of credit for the fact that you've got a reward at the end of it. That's what makes uh, uh, reinforcement learning quite interesting. And we'll see how to do that later. 
Uh, so we have the environment and we have the agent. Let's start by looking at the environment. Um, as you can see, it kind of looks like a state machine, and you can kind of think of it that way. So um, it's actually this technical name is a Markov decision process, or MDP. Um, but don't worry too much about what that means or what the Markov property is exactly, but just think of it as a state machine. So it defines two functions. If you're in a certain state and you take an action to the next state, where do you end up? And then given the current state, the action that you took, and the next state you ended up in, what rewards did you get? Those are the two things that the environment is in charge of telling us. Um, and in general, that can be stochastic, meaning it's not the same every time. It's probabilistic. So if you're in state A, I take action B. 90% of the time, I might end up in state C, but 10% of the time, I might end up in state B. And the same for the reward. It might be a kind of probability, probability distribution. Um, just an example, these are all just made up numbers, but this is an example of what the environment might look like. So it might have five states. Um, if you're in state S1 over here, and you take action one, you get a reward of five, you end up in state S2 up there. Uh, and then down at the bottom, on bottom right, we have this square, this S5. This represents a terminal state. So depending on your problem, it might be what's known as episodic, where you there's like a, a natural end to the episode. You take a bunch of uh, actions, you go through a bunch of states, and eventually you, you reach a goal, or you like, die or something. So, so it could be a very good terminal state or a very bad terminal state. Um, so, for example, say your agent is navigating through a maze. If it manages to get out of the maze, then that would be a terminal state. But then, depending on your problem, it might not be episodic. It might never end. It could be what's known as continuous, meaning there's no terminal states. You just go around and around this thing forever. Uh, so let's have a look at how we can encode this environment in Scala. Uh, I've made it a type class, so it's a trait environment which is parameterized on the state and action type. So it's completely abstract in the, the state and the action. Uh, I've given it this function called step, so this is going to represent one time step. Uh, so given the current state, which is a state, and the action taken, so the action that the agent choose, chose to take, uh, it's going to return. Um, a state, a new state, and a reward. Uh, but what is a reward? A reward is just a double. Um, state could be very complicated, but the reward is always just a, a single number. Uh, and then one other thing that it needs to tell us is, given a certain state that it's just moved into, is that a terminal state or not? So that's the environment. Uh, next, have a, let's have a look at the agent. The agent takes in the, the current state and the reward, or the previous reward, and it uh, returns the next action to take. That's its responsibility. So every time step t, um, the agent knows what state it's currently in, because we'll tell it. Uh, based on that, it chooses an action to take. Then the result of that is it's told the next state that it ends up in and what rewards it received. And based on that, somehow, through magic, it learns something. Um, so to implement agent, I have separated the agent data from the behavior. So we're just going to look at the behavior for now. Uh, when we have a look at the agent actually doing some learning, we'll see where the data fits in. But for now, we've just got this behavior type class, which is param parameterized on the agent data, the state, and the action. So the one thing that has to do is choose an action. So given agent data, so given your current internal data that you're storing about yourself, and the current state, and a list of actions that you can actually take that are valid, it needs to return the next action but also, it needs to return a function 
which, given the next state and the reward, will return a new, updated version of its data. So this is where the learning happens. So after choosing an action, finding out what reward and what next state it's in, then it is able to do some learning and it will update its own internal state and return that as its result. So we've got our agent and our environment. And generally, if you read through uh, kind of reinforcement learning papers, that's all they talk about. But when you actually come to implement this thing, a real program, you need a bit more. You need to wrap those things up in uh, what I call a runner. So this is just kind of like an entry point into the program, a harness that, that holds the agent and the environment and loops through the time steps for you. So uh, the runner is pretty simple. It starts with initial agent data and initial state. So you just kind of you choose an arbitrary state usually where you, when you want your agent to start off in and you give it some initial kind of stupid version of the agent. Maybe it's just all the values that it has are just random to start with. And then every time step uh, you ask the agent to choose an action, you tell the environment what the agent chose, the environment will tell you the new state and the new reward, you tell those to the agent, and then the agent returns an improved version of itself, so it does some learning. And then depending on what your program is actually doing, you might want to update the UI or store the values to a database or whatever. Uh, so in Scala, it would look a bit like this. So we start, oh yeah, we have some bars in here. This is our, our only mutable state in the whole thing. Uh, so we start with the initial agent data and the initial state, and then we have the step function. Um, so we ask the agent behavior to choose an action. Um, that gives you the next action. Uh, you ask the environment to take a step. So you tell it the current state and what action is chosen. That gives you the next state and the reward. Uh, then you call the agent's update function giving it the reward and the next state. That gives you an updated version of the agent. Uh, you update your current state variable, because you're now in a new state. And then you do whatever else you need to buy and sell shares or update the UI. So just to recap, our whole program looks like this. We've got our runner, that's kind of the harness or the entry point to the program. We've got two pieces of mutable state, the agent data and the current state. So they'll get updated every time step. And then it's got two type class instances, one for the agent behavior and one for the environment. So, yeah. Yeah, I so time for the first demo. Note that I haven't told you anything about learning yet. You just have to trust me that this thing is actually learning. And then after that, I'll explain how all of that works. Uh, so this is called Grid World. Um, it's very common. Is that big enough? Make it slightly bigger. Very common in reinforcement learning, reinforcement learning to use these kind of uh, simplified problems rather than immediately trying to tackle really hard stuff. You can just do really simple stuff like this grid world style of problem. So the agent is the little red dot. So the state of the environment is just where the agent is on the grid. Um, the rules or the dynamics of the environment are pretty simple. Any time it moves, uh, it just its actions are just to move one square up, down, left, or right. And every time it moves, it gets one point one reward. What was it? Zero reward. I can't remember. Zero reward. No, one reward. So any time it moves, it gets one reward. So it gets a reward every time step just for staying alive, existing. Uh, if it tries to move off the edge, like in this case, if it went left, it would get zero reward and it would just stay where it is. So it can't ever leave the grid. And then there's these two special cells, A and B. So if it's in A and it tries to move in any direction, it gets teleported down to A prime and it gets 10 points. And the same for B, but it only gets five points. So if you think about it for a little while, it's pretty obvious that the best thing the agent can do is just keep heading to A. No matter where it is on the board, it should try and get to A and then whiz down to there and then go back up to A and over and over again, like a child on a slide. 
Um, so let's see what it does. We can make it step just one time, step at a time. So it went down a bit. <laughs> moving around, moving around. Oh, it's trying to move off the board so it's not going anywhere. It's just moving around randomly at the moment because it hasn't learned anything. It's, it's only just been born and it doesn't know anything. Um, you can see, oh, it hasn't really done much yet. I'll just let it run. So you can see it moves around the board, learning stuff. Oh, it found A. Then it's updating these numbers down here. Uh, there's like a, a minus 0 0.9, for example. And there's a 7.2, a 9.9. .9. So you don't know what these numbers are yet, because I haven't explained it. But you can see that it's somehow updating its internal state with information that it's learned based on its experience. Um, and then you can take these numbers and compress them down into just a, a policy down here. So, for example, if I'm in this square here, 2, 2, then going up is the best thing that I can do, because that means that I'll end up in this A over here and get lots of reward. So, interestingly, you can see that it's found B now, and it seems quite like B. It's getting pretty friendly with B, but the interesting thing is that if you just leave it to explore for long enough, it's guaranteed to converge to the correct answer. So we'll always find A. It might spend quite a long time finding B and enjoying itself over there, but eventually it will get to the correct answer. It will converge. Um, and you can see that it's doing a bit of exploration as well, which I'll talk about later in a, in a second, but you can see that it's kind of it's got some random element. Occasionally, it doesn't seem to be following the policy that's built up. It's kind of going off piece and trying other things. OK, so obviously it was learning, but how on earth did it do all of that? How did it learn? Uh, to answer that, I'm going to take you on a, a kind of very lightning tour through reinforcement learning. It's a huge subject, but I'll just try and cover the most important aspects for the purposes of this talk. So I'm going to talk about state action values, uh, policies, prediction and control, model free versus model driven methodologies, and exploitation and exploration, and bootstrapping. So state action values. This is what those numbers were in that big table down there. Uh, they're known as Q values as well. So for each state S, for example, the agent being in cell one or two on the grid, and for each action that it can take, like move left, the agent maintains a Q value for that, for that pair of state and action, Q, S, and A. And that Q value is the estimate the agent has of the value of being in state S and taking action A. So if I'm in state action, state S, and I take action A, what's the value of that? Uh, and there's also uh, another number called Q star S of A, which is the optimal value. This value exists, but the agent doesn't actually know what it is. This is like the right answer, the correct answer. So the whole point of reinforcement learning, or in this case, Q learning, is to improve your estimate, Q, to try and get Q to equal Q star. And gradually, the agent will get make Q better and better until hopefully it converges on Q star. Uh, so I was talking about value. But what does value mean? Um, value is basically the total return of all the rewards you're going to get from that point onward. So it doesn't matter what's happened up until now. It's just right now I'm in state S. I take action A. From now until the end of time, how much reward am I going to get? Um, there is a little bit of subtlety because if your uh, if your problem is continuous, not episodic, then the total reward you get will just be infinite. If you just if you wandered around that grid forever, then you would get infinite reward. So you can do something called discounting, where you you say, what's the total reward I'm going to get, but gradually decreasing over time. So once you've got these Q values, 
um, it's easy to construct what's known as a policy. And a policy just says, if I'm in some state S, what action should I take? This is the agent's job, basically. For any given state S, the, act, the agent needs to choose an action. So the policy is what the agent is trying to build up to tell it what action is taken. And if we have this state action value function Q, then we can easily make policy. So here's my amazing patented policy that says, if I'm in state S, choose the action A with the highest Q value. So say that you've built up these estimates of Q in, in the table here. Obviously, moving right is the, the best action that you can take. It gives you the highest value. So it's just a, a very trivial policy. Once you've got a policy, then you can start doing what's known as prediction and control. So prediction is probably the easy part of it, I suppose. Prediction is measuring the performance of some policy, uh, which is usually called pi, pi for policy. Um, so given some policy that the agent has, how much value are you, is the agent going to get over time? As, so you can just run the like run the agent in the environment for a while and see what value it gets. So you're just kind of measuring the performance. Uh, and then the other side of things is once you've evaluated that policy, you know how good it is, then you can find a policy slightly better than that one. So you kind of incrementally, you evaluate the policy and then you make it slightly better. And that leads to a, a very simple general strategy for reinforcement learning, which is Start with some rubbish policy, just have all of your Q values set to zero, well, it doesn't matter. And then evaluate the current policy, find a policy that's slightly better by tweaking it slightly, and repeat. And you just keep doing that until you hopefully converge on the correct answer. Uh, models. So, depending on what your problem is that you're trying to solve, it might be possible for your agent to have a, an inbuilt model where it has knowledge of the environment. So the environment is the state machine down here. Your agent could actually be programmed with knowledge of that state machine. So it could know if I'm in state S1 and I take this action, I will get a reward of five and I will end up in S2. Um, you can just build all of that into your agent. And some some problems that you're trying to solve are amenable to that, but in the real world, there's not really that many problems where you could do that. Most of the time, if you're able to do that, then you don't really need machine learning at all. You've basically already solved the problem. Um, so in today's talk, I'm not going to be talking about model-driven uh, at all. Everything that I show you is going to be model-free. So the agent has no clue what problem it's solving. He doesn't know anything about grid worlds or like the fact that point cell A gives it 10 points and sends it down to A prime. It doesn't know that a priori. Um, all it's doing is just kind of randomly wandering around, taking actions, seeing what happens, and learning in that way. And finally, not finally, next. Um, I mentioned it briefly, but there's this concept of exploitation versus exploration. So, you want to exploit the knowledge that you've built up over time. Your agent, assuming it, it's been running for a while, it has some knowledge about its problem and it's learned some stuff. But also, you need to keep exploring your environment. So maybe you haven't found a really awesome action that you can take because you just haven't got around to it yet. So you need to keep randomly exploring to some extent. Um, and humans have this problem as well. Like when you go to your favorite restaurant and you look at the menu, do you have the hamburger that you always have because you know it's delicious, or do you try that other thing? Do you do a bit of exploring and try something else because it might be even better than the hamburger? Uh, and the way that we, agent, we can make the agent do that, uh, there's a few different algorithms that you can use, but um, one popular one is called Epsilon Green. And it's very simple, just Follow the policy that you've built up most of the time, but occasionally, say 10% of the time, pick a random action instead. And that means that you get a good balance of exploitation. Uh, if we were to write it in Scala, it looks a bit like that. 
So you've got your action values for whatever state you happen to be in. This is a map from the action to the value. And then you've got epsilon, which is some constant between zero and one. This is the probability of choosing a random action. So if, if, if the next random double that Scala gives you is less than epsilon, then pick a random action. Otherwise, it's a little bit subtle because you might have multiple actions which have the same value, the same maximum value. So say like moving left and moving up might both be the best action that you know about. So then you want to randomly pick one. Uh, and finally, um, bootstrapping is something that we are doing in this, uh, in this demo that I showed you. So this is the idea of basing estimates on other estimates. So you start off not knowing anything. You have a Q estimate of just zero for everything. But then you, you move around the environment a while, and you, start to, you get rewards, and you start to build up estimates of your Q values for each state action pair. Um, but I put question marks on them to show that they're just estimates. Again, these are nonsense numbers that are all made up. Um, but you can use the estimates of the other, sorry, use the other estimates that you built up for other state action pairs in order to update your estimate for this state action pair. So say you're in that one that's marked 3.5, question mark. You do something, you end up getting a reward of four and going into that other state at the top that's marked 7.9. And now you can update your estimate on the left, the 3.5, based on that other estimate, 7.9, which seems really weird because you're just kind of using guessed estimated numbers to update other estimated numbers. It seems kind of like it's not going to work, but magically it just eventually will converge to the right answer. You have to trust me on that. So after all of that, I can finally tell you what algorithm we're actually using to do this learning, and it's called Q-learning. And Q-learning is model-free, so it doesn't have any model of the environment. It doesn't know what problem it's solving or what returns it's going to get from each state or what state it's going to move into next. Uh, it does exploration using ex epsilon greedy, and it does bootstrapping, so it does this uh, estimates based on estimates. Uh, Q-learning is quite an advanced technique. If you read a, a reinforcement learning textbook, then it'll come about 200 pages in, halfway through. Uh, but it actually boils down to one reasonably simple update rule, which I've just thrown into your faces there without any kind of explanation. But this, uh, let's just unpack this a little bit. So this is how you update your Q value at each time step. So you've got your Q value for state T, action T, so the state you were in and the action you took. You update that to the value it had before, plus some small multiplier, alpha, times the return you got, plus another multiplier, gamma, times the maximum of all of the state action values for the state that you ended up in next. So say you got you went from state S1 into state S2. You look at your Q values for state S2 and you find the maximum out of all of the moves that you can take from state, state S2. You take your maximum Q value and you use that to update your estimate of the Q value of the state you were in before. So that's this bootstrapping idea. You take your estimate from state S2 and you use that to update your estimate from state S2. Okay, so now we know what Q-learning is and how the algorithm works. Although I haven't really explained it, I've just told you that's what it does. But trust me that that actually works. Well, you see it working on the grid world. Now that we know what it is, we can uh, have a look at how to implement it in Scala. So here is the agent data, which is the bit that I skipped over before. I showed you the behavior, but not the data. So this is the internal state that the agent holds in order to do its learning. 
Uh, again, it's abstract over the state and the action, so it doesn't matter what problem you're solving, what your state looks like and what your actions look like. Q learning doesn't care about that, that's just implementation detail, so you can abstract over that, which means that you can reuse your Q learning algorithm for lots of different problems. Uh, it's got these three parameters, alpha, which is known as the step size, gamma, which is the discount rate, and epsilon, which is the, the probability of choosing random action. So alpha kind of controls how aggressively or how quickly your agent learns. This is how much, um, I'll go backwards. Oh, yeah. So it's this alpha here in the middle which says how much you actually update your Q value for SD and it's multiplied. And then gamma is the discount rate, so this is how much the next step, the next um, state should affect the previous state. Um, so you can kind of get some intuition about it, but really they're just kind of parameters that you have to tune and try a few values and hopefully get a good one. Uh, then you've got your epsilon, which is the chance of uh, choosing random, random action. And you've got your Q values. So this is the thing that it's learning. So you've got a map from state to map, or from action to value. So for every state, you'll have a map from each of the four actions up, down, left, right to the value. Um, so now that we have we've seen what the case class looks like, we can implement the type class instance, the agent behavior. So, um, choose action, it's given the agent data, which is the current version of its, its data, it's given the current state, and it's given a list of valid actions, it needs to return uh, the action and the update function. Oh, and I didn't bother filling it in because it's quite a lot of code, sorry. Okay, um, so that's Q learning, but then we've only looked at a really simple example so far. We looked at Grid World, which had only 15 states, was it? 15 cells, so there's 15 states to keep track of. But when you look at real world problems, it's quite rare that you get a problem that simple. What's more likely is that your environment will have a really complex state, and it, it, the state space could be absolutely huge, it could be millions of states, it could be infinite. Uh, if, say, you're, you've got some continuous variable that you care about, like, say, the velocity of something or the, the angle of something, then you've got an infinite state space. Um, and that just, Q learning just doesn't scale to that, it doesn't work. There's no way that it can gain enough experience to learn proper Q values for an infinite number of states. So you find that what you need to do is map your large environment state space down to a smaller state space that your agent thinks about. Um, and I'll show you an example in a second of a problem where, where we've done that. Um, so we need one more piece in our program, which I've called state conversion, and this is just uh, that mapping from environment state to agent state. Um, so our program looks very similar to before, but now it's got this state conversion type class instance as well. Uh, so let's look at a more interesting problem that involves this kind of state conversion. Uh, this is pole balancing, which is quite a, um, a classic problem in the, the uh, reinforcement learning literature. So the idea is you've got this cart that you control, your agent controls the cart by pushing it to the left or to the right, and it has to do that at every time step, it has to choose. And it, on top of it is balancing this pole, which is on image, which I haven't bothered to draw. So um, this is an episodic task, so it has a terminal state, and you the agent fails if the pole topples over to more than 12 degrees in each direction, or if the cart 
goes whizzing off too far to the side and hits hits either of these walls. So uh, there's no reward most of the time. The only thing that happens is if the car the thing topples over or the car hits the wall, at the end of the episode it gets a minus one reward. So spare a thought for our poor agent here. It's got no clue what it's doing. It's completely in the dark. It's just randomly picking actions left or right. Occasionally somebody comes along and hits it with a stick and says, you failed. Um, so just to prove that this is actually quite a hard problem, I've made a human playable version of it. So this is, I'm going to try playing it in real time. I lasted 0 0.18 seconds. Oh, 0. Point, oh I got 1.08 seconds. So it's actually quite hard. Uh, now we can see the Asian have a go. So uh, just to explain the state conversion that it's doing to start with. The state of the environment tracks is very detailed. It's tracking the position of the cart relative to the middle of the screen, the velocity of the cart, uh, the angle that the pole is currently at, and the angular velocity, like how quickly the angle is changing. Um, and there's some quite complicated nonlinear differential equations, which based on those four parameters, they uh, it, they describe the dynamics of the system, the physics of the, how the car actually moves around and how the thing topples over. The environment is tracking that down to lots and lots of decimal places, but that's way too much information for the agent to deal with. So um, the agent just kind of chops up the state space into less granular pieces. So it's got, is the car position, it could be left, middle, or right. So is it kind of in the middle of the screen? Is it on the left? Is it on the right? And the same with velocity. Am I going kind of slowly, or am I going really quickly to the left, really quickly to the right, and so on? So the agent ends up with 160-something um, states that it needs to get around. So we can make it run one time step. Oh, it's starting to topple over a little bit. And the agent at this point doesn't know anything, so it's just randomly moving left and right. Uh, we can make it run one episode to the end. So it la lasted half a second. And it can do a few episodes. And you can see if I scroll down a bit. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So it's learning some Q values here. You can see that it got minus one, obviously failed when it was in this state. It got a negative reward. But so far, for all of these other states, it hasn't um, done, hasn't got enough experience, so it just set them to zero for now. So it's been through these states, but it hasn't learned properly yet. If we run a few more episodes. Uh, it's filling in more of its state space, it's got some more experience, and you can see it's starting to learn. It's got some numbers that are not 0 or 1. And this is all done using that Q-learning algorithm. And then if we let it run forever, then hopefully it should start to learn and get reasonably good. Quite hypnotic to watch. Isn't it? So it's, um, it's done 22 episodes now, and it seems to be already learning. It's very quick at learning this problem. I think it may have almost solved it. Been going for 12 seconds now, 13. Okay, so it lasted 19 seconds, but it's going to get better and better and better. Eventually, it just solves it and it can balance it forever. And the amazing thing about this, just to reiterate, is that the agent has no idea what it's doing. It doesn't know anything about carts or poles or angular velocities. It doesn't get any feedback at all apart from when it fails. So most of the time it's getting a re reward of zero, but occasionally it's getting hit with a stick. And still it manages to learn this quickly how to solve a problem that it knows nothing about. So you can see there's a lot of potential in reinforcement learning, I hope.
sorry. Okay, so just to uh, repeat myself slightly, the environment on the left-hand side, that's the state space that the environment is tracking, so the, the position, the velocity, the angle, and the angular velocity, and that's almost infinite number of states. And then the agent is just tracking more rough versions of that, 162 states. Um, and that is kind of the limit of how many states you can have. Once you get into the thousands and tens of thousands of states, it starts to become a lot more difficult to make the agent learn at a sensible rate. So a lot of the skill, or the art, I suppose, of reinforcement learning is working out how to uh, design your agent's state space reward function so that the agent learns at a sensible rate. So this is a very basic version of reinforcement learning, but as you can see, it actually solves interesting problems. But there's so much more that you can do. So you have smarter policies. Um, for example, instead of epsilon greedy, where we just randomly choose an action n percent of the time, you can have better policies like softmax, or you could make epsilon decay over time, because in theory, your agent should be learning, so it should become more confident about its Q values. So it should stop just kind of doing random actions. It should kind of uh, trust its own learning. Uh, there's more efficient learning algorithms than Q learning. Q learning is um, a bit old fashioned these days, I suppose. There's T lambda, Q lambda, eligibility traces. There's, there's a lot going on out there. And it's still a very active area of, of research. It's by no means a solved problem. Um, and then you can solve or work on problems with very large or infinite state spaces where this lookup table approach where we store a map in memory of Q values just doesn't work because the state space is way too big. Um, and that's where you have to do things like function approximation to say my state and action are approximately this, and so the Q value should be approximately this. Um, and that's where you start to get into deep reinforcement learning, which is quite a, a fashionable topic. Uh, so that's all I have. There is actually another um, demo planned, but it's not quite ready yet. Um, but if you'd like to learn more, there's a really good book called Reinforcement Learning and the Introduction. And the second edition just came out in about three weeks. Um, it's really readable and gives a good introduction without getting too deep into the mathematics of it. Uh, there's also a really good um, series of lectures on YouTube. This second link down here, the RL course by David Silver, who works for DeepMind, and he worked on AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero. Um, if you'd like to see the slides or the demos and play around for yourself or see the code behind them, they will be at this link, but they're not yet. That's it. Thank you. I can attempt to answer questions, but I'm not really an expert. Yeah. So using this algorithm to learn, you need to every time what's the best next option. But that will create most efficient paths, maybe for some perspective. If it's like the upper right mm. corner, does not that need to go away? Or uh, yeah. so if it's in B, yeah. does it know that if it goes away, it can get more points? Yes. Or, yeah, it does eventually learn that because uh, it will start off by discovering that A is really good because it gets 10 points. And then it will use that estimate to update the estimates of all of the ones around A. So it will know that if it's in any of these five here, it should go towards A. Or like if it's in the top right one next to the Yeah, so that learning will grow. Not if it's the other square. Yeah. So that learning will gradually spread out across the whole grid. So it will start here and then it will learn what to do in these squares and then what to do in these squares and then eventually it will reach the whole grid. Okay, we should probably stop staring at that now. <laughs> I'm going to go mad. Pardon? Oh, yeah. You're hooked, aren't you?
Oh, it's, it's lasted. Oh. Seems to be a bit of a slump. <laughs> Uh, you can see how much of its state space it's explored here. So there's still huge areas of the state space that it just hasn't got around to exploring, these blank areas here. And a lot of these are zeros as well. So that means it's been in this state once, but not enough to learn anything about it. And it hasn't even been over to the right-hand side at all yet. <laughs> so it takes a while. Oops, sorry, I killed it. <laughs> On that note... <laughs>